The self-haunted man jostled the scraping limbs of wild and accusing foliage. The mud began to harden beneath the soles of his bare feet, stopping the flow of a crimson trail from being left behind. The voices in pursuit mingled with the slithering of creeping things and ominous cackles of predatory beasts. Had his intention been that of seeking refuge from the others who despised his life worse than he himself, the self-haunted man would have feared the shadows to which he fled. He certainly did fear them, but the darkness held so much uncertainty for his fate. He wanted those eyes of malice upon him in the torchlight. He wanted to cry out, Here I am, let justice be done unto me. Let your arms tear me away from this world. And because that was his true intention, the self-haunted man fled his captors, seeking safety. Were he hungry, he would starve. Were he clean, he would seek filth to bathe in. Were he to be confronted by gentle and good people, he would instead strike all with wrath unfounded. The self-haunted man sought now for his own destruction, to rid those that lived in this world of the hardship and desperation of any further torment from his corrupted mind. Or was it his soul? He hoped for the former, but he hoped for death more. And because he longed so much for oblivion for the sake of relieving others, the self-haunted man instead fled death for the sake of prolonging his own misery. The stars were gone, as was the moon. Blackness surrounded him, and his steps began to slow. It was because he now wanted to travel deep into the shadows, into the groping reach of whatever creature that found him appealing enough to sate its hunger. Slower and slower did the self-haunted man keep his pace, until he finally halted himself in a cold brook. Around him, the forest seemed to flee him instead. Even the wind made no attempt to touch his sweat and muck-soaked flesh. There was nothing but the moisture which stood in the air and on his breath. Run, he commanded himself. His body did not obey. Fall down and drown yourself. His body did not obey. Cry out, cry out so you can be found. His tongue remained still. Help me, he pleaded with whoever listened apart from his disobedient body. Slay me. A light flickered in the distance for a moment, then died. A faded clicking sound echoed. Then the spark erupted once more. In an instant, the wood was alight with the torches of a distant stranger, who immediately spied the self-haunted man. The figure lumbered through the swamp with great effort, and his form took on a monstrous quality in the rippling shadow from the flame. The self-haunted man began to back away, while the hope of his destruction filled within. Run to him, embrace him, fall to your knees, let him take you. His retreating steps quickened. He began to turn. No, he shouted. Sorrow filled his heart as the figure left his view, as did his chances for an end, when suddenly he heard the voice. Flee from me! Be gone! Horror caught hold of the self-haunted man, as not only did the words sound as though they were spoken from a wrath which haunted all the charnel houses, but his body stopped in defiance. The figure was approaching from behind him now, the squelching of mud from an irregular trod. The light of his torch revealed all the rotted bark of a desolate glade. The self-haunted man was afraid. He did not want to face this other. Somehow the thought of it was more frightening than the previous idea of the clutching abomination which lurked in the night. Yet, with these fears, turn he did. The figure hobbling towards him was cloaked in robes, smattered in grime and tattered with decay. The smell of him was vile, and the self-haunted man loathed even more his predicament, seeing how he would make no attempt to cover his nose. He breathed freely the rotten air. The eyes were the most troubling component of this menagerie, 
for they were alight with knowledge of itself and the world around them. This was a man. Somehow this walking desiccation was a man. The wretch spoke again, his voice softer in volume, but no less crippling to be heard, nor lacking in command. Stay in that brook. Do not come on land with me. The self-haunted man disobeyed completely. He promptly left the cold, murky waters and stood with the wretch on dry ground. The wretch kept his gaze upon the self-haunted man while unshouldering a satchel he carried. Do not sit. The self-haunted man disobeyed. The wretch slowly hunkered down to the earth before him and stuck the torch into the soft soil. He set the satchel into the small space between and said, Do not open this. As not commanded, the self-haunted man pulled open the drawstring bag and found a large bread loaf and a water skin. He was relieved at the sight, even if it belonged to the wretch, but he knew that he could not make himself eat or drink. Then he heard the wretch speak for him to not do as he desired. The bread was delicious and filling. The only time he would ever eat is when he wanted to succumb to starvation. The water was pure. Likewise, he would never quench his thirst unless he gave in to death. The self-haunted man was restored, as much as he could have ever considered it possible, and yet he pondered the meaning of this charity. He wanted to thank the wretch for his mercy. He reached forward and smote this benefactor with a painful palm. The wretch looked back after the blow and simply said, You're welcome. The self-haunted man was commanded by the wretch to stay awake throughout the rest of the night, to which he disobeyed. In the morning, the black veil over the foliage was driven away, and the swampland was revealed around the two men. The self-haunted man was glad to have rested so well, but despaired knowing that he had the fresh vigor to unintentionally cause strife among his fellows. What were the reasons for sustaining the unsustainable? Why keep alive a flame which threatens to grow out of control? You are a cursed man, said the wretch, one who has set aside for a holy purpose to which the evils of this world would know from your birth. As a child, you walked in the moonlight and that which is whole delighted in the sight of your promise. But she knew your strength was in your intent to help those who were hurting, to guide those lost into the light of the crescent moon. She severed your soul with a polished glass to which your reflection alone understands what you intend. Tears filled the eyes of the self-haunted man as he laughed at the wretch's scorn, but... The wretch continued, For you to do good, you must have to intend evil. For you to help, you mean to harm. To love without, you hate within. You could not accept this. She knew you could not accept this. But to want to do good, you would do evil. The wretch reached out and grabbed the arm of the self-haunted man. When he would have allowed this, he began to fight the wretch struggling to pull free. He wanted to listen. He wanted to be a man sacred and a benefit to the world. But with the longing came the violence to free himself from the one man who could help him. But the wretch remained calm and held him tightly in place. The self-haunted man was embraced by the rot and stink of this vile thing. He was disgusted by him, even though he loved him. He did not want to be held by the corpse, even though he had fed him. He wanted to scream from the appalling sight of this most precious being that was able to see within and speak to the voice never heard. Instead, the self-haunted man ceased from the struggle, and in a brief moment of affection and self-reflection, he returned the embrace of the wretch. His mind was quiet. There were no commands to be disobeyed, no intention to be fled from. They were the same, soldiers in the same army, fighting in the same war. He began to sob into the rotten cowl of the wretch, 
and the wretch held him until he stopped. When it ended, the self-haunted man stepped away from his friend when he wanted to stay. He walked on into the day which he did not want to face. He would be among people when he wished to remain alone, but his intentions were to be sacred, to be a benefit, to be whole. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead and Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, and Sue Casper for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zoronan, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Sarah ASMR42, and Bella Lee for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks everyone so much. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you too would like to support the show, come on down to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. For just $5 a month, you get your stories 12 hours early at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. Also, if you'd like to join our Ghostly Reader contributor tier over on Patreon, you get a book anytime I write one on your doorstep, as long as you live in the continental U.S., of course. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.